in, in Hollywood and in the industry and the stuff we do, there's a lot of like insider secrets to keeping your career going and a lot of insider secrets to, 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 to making things tick. And uh, I feel like a fraud. Uh, my name is actually not even Ashton. Ashton is my middle name. My first name's Chris. And, and it always has been, and I, it got changed when I was like 19 and I became an actor. But there were some really amazing things that I learned when I was Chris. And I wanted to share those things with you guys because I think it, it's helped me be here today. So it's really three things. The first thing is about opportunity. The second thing is about being sexy. And the third thing is about living life. So first, opportunity. I believe that opportunity looks a lot like hard work. When I was 13, I had my first job with my dad carrying shingles up to the roof. And then I got a job washing dishes at a restaurant. And then I got a job in a grocery store deli. And then I got a job in a factory sweeping Cheerio dust off the ground. And I've never had a job in my life that I was better than. I was always just lucky to have a job. And every job I had was a stepping stone to my next job. And I never quit my job until I had my next job. And so opportunities look a lot like work. Number two, being sexy. The sexiest thing in the entire world is being really smart. And being thoughtful and being generous. Everything else is crap, I promise you. It's just crap that people try to sell to you to make you feel like less. So don't buy it. Be smart, be thoughtful, and be generous. The third thing is something that I just relearned when I was making this movie about Steve Jobs. And Steve Jobs said, when you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way that it is. And that your life is to live your life inside the world and try not to get in too much trouble and maybe get an education and get a job and make some money and have a family. But life can be a lot broader than that when you realize one simple thing. And that is that everything around us that we call life was made up by people that are no smarter than you. And you can build your own things. You can build your own life that other people can live in. So build a life. Don't live one, build one. Find your opportunities and always be sexy. I love you guys. You gotta become a risk taker. Write that down. Viscott said, if you're not willing to risk, you can't grow. And if you can't grow, you can't become your best. And if you can't become your best, you can't be happy. And if you can't be happy, then what else is there? You know what? I saw Dr. Norman Vincent Peale 23 years ago. But for 13 years, I wouldn't take the chance. For 13 years, I was living in my comfort zone. For 13 years, I kept saying, Les Brown, you can't do that. Les Brown? You can't have that kind of audience. Les Brown, you don't have the oratorical skills. You don't have the knowledge. You don't have the money. I kept saying, I can't do that. There's an old African proverb that, that says, if there's no enemy within, the enemy outside can do us no harm. Bishop talks about the enemy in me. If there's no enemy within, how many of you know that you've been your own worst enemy? Raise your hands. So you've got to be willing to get outside your comfort zone. And no one could have told me that the willingness to get outside of my comfort zone, the willingness to fail, the willingness to try to experiment, the willingness to take some chances, the willingness to do something I'd never done, 
that in the last 12 years, for 13 years, I didn't do it. I convinced myself I couldn't do it. Then the last 12 years, I've earned in excess of $14 million. Let me tell you something. $14 million, a good garden and a healthy hog, and you can make it through the winter in Birmingham, Alabama. Do you hear me? No one could have told me I have two books, Live Your Dreams, and it's not over until you win. No one could have told me. Born in an abandoned building on the floor, labeled educable mentally retarded. No college training. No one could have told me I would have produced five specials for public television. That I'd had three years ago the highest rated, fastest canceled talk show in the history of television. Because I wouldn't do those conflict and controversy shows. No one could have told me I had no idea that I could do what I'm doing right now. Let me tell you what I know about you and I don't know you. You got greatness within you. One of Dr. Ho Dr. Um, King's mentors, Dr. Howard Thurman said something one night. I was reading and I couldn't sleep. He said the ideal situation for a man or woman to die is to have family members standing around their bed, praying with them as they cross over. He said, but imagine if you will, being on your deathbed and standing around you are the ideas, the dreams that have been given to you by life, the talents, the gifts that you've never nurtured, that you never developed, the skills that you never did anything with, standing around your bed looking at you with large angry eyes saying we came to you, only you could have given us life. And now we must die with you forever. And the question is, if you died now, what dreams, what ideas, what talents, what abilities, what skills, what books, what sermons, what seminars, what businesses will die with you? Miles Monroe said the wealthiest place on the planet is not in the Far East where they have oil in the ground. It's not in South Africa where they have diamond mines. He said the wealthiest place on the planet is the cemetery. Because there you find dreams not pursued, books never written, songs never sung, sermons never delivered, businesses never erected, talents never nurtured, skills never developed. You survived one out of 40 million sperms. You were born to win. God wants you to be rich and wealthy and successful and to live the abundant life. You must affirm that for yourself every day. So as you look at yourself and you look at your life and you look at your circumstances, as you work on your goals and your dreams, here's some things I want to give you. Write this down. Hold yourself to high standards. See, what if Bishop T.D. Jakes had decided when he first received the idea of the Manpower Conference that it could not be? What if he had allowed, allowed that idea to die? We would not be here. See, many of you here, you are pregnant with some ideas. I'm telling you what I know. I will leave here this afternoon, tonight, in one hour, doing what I'm doing now, in one hour, I earned in excess of $150,000. I had no idea that I had the capacity to do what I'm doing right now. You've got genius in you. You're made in the lactis and image of God. You've got greatness in you. You have some special stuff in you. You showed up with it. So as you look at your life and you decide to become a risk taker, make it okay to fail, to experiment, trial and error, repeat after me please, no test, no testimony. Yeah, you're going to face some hard times. What's the first thing they say when you get on an airplane before they take off? Fasten your seatbelt. Why? Because you will experience some turbulence before you reach a comfortable altitude. Life was testing me when the man looked at me and said, you have prostate cancer. Your tumor is too large to have the surgery. We're going to give you radiation seed implants.
The most anybody's ever gotten was 90. They gave me 238. I went back three weeks ago. They checked my PSA level, which indicates the presence of cancer in your prostate area. One to four is normal. Beyond that is that you have cancer and it's spreading. When I first went a year ago, it was 6.1. When I went three weeks ago at Howard University Hospital, they gave me an MRI, it was 10.5. The guy said, I'm sorry to tell you this. I said, what do you mean? You're in the same situation that you were in when I when you came here. Here's something I heard. At Christ Universal Temple Church, at an restaurant, Bishop T.D. Jakes was praying for a lady in a wheelchair. And it's odd how things come to you. When he finished praying for the lady, I'm sure there were some questions were asked that weren't verbal, that if the prayer worked, why didn't she get up and walk? And what he said as he was walking away, healing takes first place first he said healing takes place first in the spirit it didn't matter about his numbers it didn't matter about their diagnosis judge not according to appearances you must have a faith to call forth those things that be not as though they were now do you really believe? See, it's one thing to believe when you got money in your pocket. It's one thing to believe when your marriage is working out and you got your health and your children acting like they got good sense. Oh, it's good to say, oh, the Lord is blessing me. It's easy to believe then. Oh, but when you get that diagnosis, say you ain't gonna be here long. When you lose your job, when someone you thought you'd be with for the rest of your life said, no, we can't do this no more. That's when you have to stand. That's when you have to begin to live this faith. And that's not on you. That's when you got to call on something. How do you let that mind be in you? You got to be out of your mind to believe in spite of these numbers, you can still make it. In spite of the pain you're feeling, you can still come back again. You got to be out of your mind. That's right. I'm in that Christ mind. I believe it. And not when things are just favorable, not fair weather faith. And you've got to believe that. When you're going out here with your ideas, with your products, with your services, and part of being successful is you got to hold yourself to high standards. I use Bishop Jakes as a model. His people take care of you. He's thorough. Hold yourself to high standards, whatever you do. There's no saying, do not go where the path may lead, but go where there's no path and leave a trail. Treat people with respect. Treat them the way that you want to be treated. Tony, who's with me, who's been assigned to me, courteous, respectful, call several times. Is there anything I can do for you? Can I help you out? That's first class service. If you decide, to provide first-class service. John H. Johnson, a book called Making Against the Odds, he said, there's no defense against an excellence that meets a pressing public need. When I decided to become involved in the motivational industry, I didn't have the money of a Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, of Zig Ziglar, of Tony Robbins, and all the other giants out there. I had the gift of gab. So what I did was I trained myself, I disciplined myself to read three to four books a week. First, I started out a month. Now I've increased it with a reading system that I have. Mr. Washington said, Mr. Brown, yes, sir. Do you want to make it? Yes, sir. First, you've got to develop your mind, young man, because you don't get in life what you want, you get in life what you are. Next, you've got to develop your communication skills. Once you open your mouth, you tell the world who you are. They said about Jesus, who obviously was an effective communicator, never speck a man. The reason that you are here, it's because no one can milk scripture and deliver a sermon that can transform your life and have you jumping up and down like you crazy, like T.D. Jakes. I'm home one day looking at this video my daughter gave me called, He Called Me Son. Let me tell you something. By the end of that video, and I've never seen my father. When that video got to the end, I was going to the television and said, Daddy! 
daddy, come back, daddy. <laughs> I push reverse and back it up and said, daddy. Let me tell you something. He just broke me down in my bedroom. <laughs> All by myself. I'm looking around, see if anybody see me. <laughs> that man crafted that message. You hear me? I'm crying like I'm at a funeral. <laughs> I want <will> my daddy. <laughs> see, that's a gift. You hear me? He, that's a gift. You, your people use his word anointed. They should not only place I've ever seen it applicable is in his case. That's the only thing. I mean to tell you, I think I'm a good speaker, but this is, this is a bad boy we got up in here. Words cannot encompass the symbolism of what we have the chance to see up in here. And yet, he's down to earth. I mean down to earth, wear all these little funny outfits he has. I mean it knocks me out. <laughs> And let me tell you what my daughter said to me. My daughter, my oldest daughter, is on his advance team. She said, you know what? I was listening to Dion last night, and I think I'm going to call um, Bishop Jake's daddy, too. I said, I wish you would. I mean, you, I, I will throw you out here right now and break his leg to by calling him daddy. Now, here's I want you to write this down. Write down, take responsibility for your life. Take responsibility for your life. Now that's a very important. Remember what, what, what Bishop said last night about Adam? Adam, when God asked him what happened, Adam did not want to take responsibility for what he had done. Men have always tried to escape that. So the reason I'm, I'm telling you that we got to start owning our stuff as men. Write down the next R, and that is not only responsibility, but be resourceful. A lot of men, I don't have it. I had it, I'll give it. If the women had that kind of attitude, the children would starve to death. The reason that they eat, the reason that they have some place to stay and to lay their heads and have clothes on their backs, because the women decide, I'm going to make it happen no matter what, and they're resourceful. My mama raised seven without a man. She cooked. She cleaned houses. Here's something else that will cause you to reach your goals when you leave here. Write this down. Reasons. Compelling reasons. While you're here, when you make this covenant with God, when you decide to live like a conqueror, when you decide to become more successful, to create wealth, to be a change agent in your community, what is it that can keep you on the straight and narrow? that will cause you to keep your commitment to your commitment. I used to do door-to-door -door sales with a man named Sam Axelrod. Sam Axelrod was intrigued by me because when he came to pick me up, he didn't have to blow his horn. I was downstairs waiting for Sam when he came around the corner. And unlike the men that work with him and other young people, when it got dark and Sam blew the horn, everybody ran to the station wagon. And they would do a head count. And they say, who's here? So everybody's here except Les. And they say, hey, Les, come on. 